be with y'all this morning. See a couple jerseys in the audience, absolutely. I'm a Cowboys fan, I'm sorry. Uh, but today's sermon is on suffering, and so that's why they sent me over here, because we know better than anybody what it means to suffer. Hey, in just a moment, my name is Kevin Thompson, by the way, I'm the married life pastor around here at Bayside, but get the opportunity to come over, thank you, Mom, and uh, get the opportunity to come over and uh, be here, and what an honor it is uh, to be here, and obviously uh, an honor to stand where Jason Cain stands so often. I don't respect him as a golfer, but as a pastor and a preacher, I have nothing but deep respect uh, for him. He, I wish he would have warned me that his mom was in the previous service. I wouldn't have made fun of him quite as much, and uh, she and I had a talking afterwards, and so I'm on my best behavior today. Now, she's absolutely great. Hey, a couple of announcements I do want to go over. A couple of things that are coming up. This next weekend, we do have a marriage conference. It's happening over at our Granite Bay campus, and so if you are in any significant relationship, and so if you're seriously dating, engaged, married, uh, if you don't know if you're seriously uh, dating or not, invite them to the marriage conference. Um, <laughs> If they say no, then you're not. If they say yes, then you are. But my guess is, because of his pseudo-humility, Jason hasn't told you, Jason and Stephanie are some of the main stage speakers Friday night. And so let's make sure that we show up there, support them. You can text Blue Oaks to 56316. If you'll use the code Bayside, it'll drop that price way down. I think it's like $49. Have breakouts on Saturday. Should be, we'll be done by noon on Saturday. So uh, don't worry uh, about that. Should be a great time. And then on the back of your rundown, because these are the ways that we are going to run you down over the, <laughs> these next couple of weeks. On the, that's the Bayside. On the back, you can see these marriage nights. So I'm going to be over here the Thursday following uh, marriage conference, so not this Thursday, but for the four following Thursdays, I'm going to be here. We're going to go through my book, Friends, Partners, and Lovers, and so if you are uh, considering marriage or in marriage, I would highly encourage that. Around here, we talk about how we encourage couples one semester every other year uh, to work on their marriage, work on the relationship. If you do that, that consistency, it'll develop with any of the skills that you need. So I always encourage it in this way. Take the odd year of your anniversary date. So Jenny and I have been married 23 years, so this is the odd year. So ask your wife how long you've been married. And then take the odd year of your anniversary date, and if you will give a, a semester of that year to your marriage, if you will work the odds, I think it will change the odds of, of your chance of marital success. So let me encourage those two things. If, if within any of that, marriage conference specifically, if you need that scholarship, to, if finances are tight, just let us know. We'll take care of that. We don't want to turn anybody away uh, in any way. So Philippians chapter 1 is where we're going to be uh, today. So Jenny and I had gotten married. We were living in Birmingham, Alabama at the time I was going to seminary uh, down there. We got married, got on our honeymoon, came back, and some friends of ours asked us if we wanted to go play tennis there whenever we had first gotten back. And we said, absolutely. And so we're, now we're no good whatsoever. We're not good at tennis at all. Uh, there's two ways to be confident on the tennis court. Either you can do years of practice and dedication and get really good, or you can find opponents who are just worse than you and just play them all the time. So that's what Jenny and I did. We played this one couple. They never beat us. We were highly confident in everything that was happening. But we got back from our honeymoon and we lost the first set. And I was nervous. I don't, I don't like to lose, right? A little distracted, everything that's going on. But I thought, that's all right, we'll pick up in the second set. And then we lost the game in the second set. And, and now we're in trouble. And I felt as though it was possible, just my interpretation, that maybe my partner was not quite paying as a much of attention to the game as I thought she should be paying. But I didn't speak this, I just thought it the first time. And then the second time, I took the passive-aggressive approach and I said, hey, honey, there's a great tennis match happening right here. And so if you would like just pay attention to it, it would be a, a great thing. And that was not well received. And, um, and, and so then the, the third time when it got really tight, I actually called timeouts. And I said, hey, we need to have a little pep talk. So I went back and I said, hey, Jenny. All right, so in life, there are winners and there are losers. And, uh, you know, they come in all different shapes and sizes and all these kind of things. But... But hey, I, I just want you to know now, you're a Thompson now. And, and here's, here's what this means, <laughs> that, that we're winners. We're never the most talented, we're never the best, but we just figure out a way to win. So I don't know what you used to be when you had your dad's name, but now that you have this name, this is how we're going to do it. And she said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. If you would get your serve in, we would have no problem with these people right now, right? Who are you? What, what defines you? 
even your name, Proverbs says that, that there's a power in a good name. What, what does your name even mean? Does it, does it have a, a substance to it whenever you walk in the room because of who you actually are? What is it that now defines who you are? I think in part, that's what Paul's going to get to in Philippians chapter 1 today. If we can grasp hold of it, I think it can transform so many things in our lives. So let's pick up where Jason left off uh, last week, uh, Philippians chapter 1 beginning in verse number 27. And then we're going to read the beginning of verse of chapter number 2 as well, just to make him nervous next week, because it's a really good passage. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one of the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. By being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, and not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. So we've entered into this series on the book of Philippians. So, so Paul had, had helped the church in Philippi get started, had now gone to a different location, and now he is in prison. We don't actually know where. Uh, many people think it was Rome. Many people think it was Ephesus. Some think it was Caesarea. It's interesting whenever you're in prison so much that you write a letter about your life and people don't even know which prison you're in at the moment. That's how, how much suffering Paul actually went through, but, but, but Rome is pretty legitimate whenever we think about it, but he's in prison. Now the church at Philippi is worried about Paul, uh, about what is taking place within his own life. They now want to check in on him. They take up a collection. They send it with Epaphroditus to Paul, where Paul gets a visit from Epaphroditus, bringing out this care package, and, and while Epaphroditus is there, Paul writes this letter back to the church at Philippi to encourage them, because he understands, in listening to Epaphroditus, that some believe that, that Paul is suffering, and, and they worry about him, but they also think that somehow the advancement of the gospel, the mission of the church is now being held back because of what has happened uh, to Paul. But Paul writes to encourage them to say, hey, that's not happening at all. I understand why you think my imprisonment might hold back the mission, but actually God is now using it to, to push his mission forward. So whenever you start to suffer, you don't have to hesitate in thinking, oh, I'm missing out in some way. Instead, you can trust God's divine sovereignty, his providence being at work to know that whatever God sends your way, he can use now for your good and also for his glory. So he takes a, a, the, the format of how a letter in that time would be written, and, and he writes it kind of in a Christianized way. So he says, Paul, uh, now a servant of Christ Jesus, uh, to the church uh, now at Philippi. And, and then he gets in and he gives a prayer. And anytime you read one of the epistles and you hear Paul's prayer, you want to pay special attention to that and keep on coming back to it with each section of Scripture. Because as Paul prays, he tends to drip in the things he really wants the people to understand. And so in verses 9 and 10 of chapter number 1, Paul prays, I pray that your love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and be holy and blameless upon that day of the Lord Jesus and righteous in everything that you do. He prays that your love, your affection, would now abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So he's basically saying, hey, church at Philippi, your affection is well known. Your affection for me, your affection to the Lord. You have this desire now. Your, your heart is set right. Uh, but I pray that you would now wed with that holy affection uh, a wisdom, uh, a knowledge, a depth of insight and understanding. There's an implication here that you and I can have a desire to love, the affections of love. Uh, but if we don't have wisdom and knowledge wedded to that, our love can actually prevent us from doing what's best. Love is good, but love is not all you need. We need this knowledge and wisdom to come alongside of it. Love doesn't always feel loving. And so I've worked with parents who had full affection for their children. But the actions they were taking toward that child, while they thought it felt loving, wasn't actually loving. 
what they missed out on was the wisdom and the knowledge and the depth of insight. And so Paul prays for this affectionate church that they would now grow in this perspective of God as well so that their affection that now could be directed in the right way toward the right action. Now, Pastor Ray last night was preaching in Granite Bay and he told the story. This is where I get all of my stuff. And, and so I just show up on Sunday, Saturday night, take good notes and then come preach. And, and so he told the story about being on a plane and uh, it was experiencing severe turbulence. And they could tell they were going up and down, but they couldn't get out of the turbulence. And the pilot came on uh, the intercom and said, hey, you know, you've experienced this turbulence. I'm so sorry. He said, I have some bad news, but I also have some good news. He said, the bad news is we've tried multiple elevations and we can't get out of this turbulence. And, and not only that, but we have 100 more miles to go with it. He said, the good news is we're going 378 miles an hour. We'll be out of it in seven minutes. And Ray said, the moment the pilot said that, all the anxiety in the plane just was deflated. It all went away. Even though their situation hadn't changed, they were still bouncing around, but just knowing it was about to come to an end, it changed everything, all because they had the perspective of the pilot. What Paul's trying to do here is to give us the perspective of the pilot, to get this vision, to see our lives in the context of, of not just the circumstances and the turbulence that's going on right now, but get the big picture of what's going on so that we may be able to figure out how to properly interpret our lives. And so he follows up that prayer that your love will abound more and more in the knowledge and depth of insight. He gets in verse number 12, he begins to tell his own scenario. What's going on with his own life? Now concerning what has happened to me, verse number 12, the text says, I want you to know what, what was meant to hinder the gospel has actually served to advance the gospel. And, and so this imprisonment that I'm experiencing at this moment, I understand why you think it might be holding me back, but in reality, it is pushing forward the very message that I'm proclaiming. And, and I'm so convinced now that God is so in charge that whatever comes my way, if it be life or death, whatever comes my way, I can now trust God in what is taking place. And it leads to such an extent that verse number 21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the ultimately extreme example of whatever were to come your way. And so by the time we reach verse number 27, he's now going to take the picture off of him and now onto his listeners of which we would be included. So based on everything Paul has said so far, love, abounding more and more, knowledge and depth of insight, everything that's happened with his own life, actually serving to advance the gospel, when we think it would hinder the gospel, what are we supposed to do in response to that? Verse number 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord. Whatever. Now, notice, I don't have a study Bible on me right now. You might, but notice in your Bible, if you have one with you, notice there's no footnote there. It doesn't say whatever, unless you live in California in 2023, whatever, unless you're in this kind of relationship, whatever, unless your parents are this way, whatever, unless your boss does this, it, it says whatever comes your way. For Paul, it's life or death. Whatever comes your way, conduct yourselves now in a manner worthy of the gospel. You know, if you take that word back to the original Greek, at the very heart of the original Greek there, with that word whatever, comes the word from which we get the word whatever. <laughs> That's why the translators translated it that way. I, I, can't, I can't do some verbal gymnastics to get you out of this. It means any circumstance that you are currently going through, anything you face this week, there is a manner by which you and I are supposed to act. And now, now think about the freedom that comes from this. We hear something like this and we think it's so rigid. Oh, he's about to give us some rules. And, and you can even take it back to the Sermon on the Mount. We're supposed to live out the Sermon on the Mount and how restricting that can be. There, there's not restriction in this. This is now freedom that now comes our way. Uh, we don't have to figure out in the moment whether we're going to tell the truth or whether we're going to lie. We don't have to figure out in the moment whether or not we're going to love other people and treat them fairly. Uh, we don't have to go through our lives gauging, are you worthy of the love of God or not? In every situation, whatever comes our way, our actions are not never determined by the external circumstances or the people that we are interacting with, whether it be kings or paupers or anyone in between, uh, liars, thieves, truth tellers, how we respond to other people is solely determined by how God has treated us, not how they're treating us. There's freedom in that. 
There's freedom. There's some of you who are, who are wrecking your brains at this moment, trying to figure out some situations that you can find the ease and give up control of all of that. All you have to do is love them, no matter what they're doing. What is the most loving action to take toward that person right now? Abounding more and more knowledge and depth of insight. But that's the only challenge. It's for you to love them. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner. It's interesting, one of the translations of the Christian Standard Bible translates this verse this way. As citizens of heaven, now carry out your actions in a manner worthy of the Lord. It's because this word that the NIV translates as, as conduct and as Greek root actually goes back to, to the word from which we get the word policy. Also the word politics. You see, Philippi was a Roman colony. And as a Roman colony, what that meant is it, it was under the rules of, of the Roman Empire. And, and so citizens there were actually Roman citizens. And, and they took a tremendous amount of pride in their citizenship in Rome. There was a power in that. They, they, were, the, they were the big dog, right? And, and they, they kind of they got that, right? And so they would, they would wear the Roman hats and the Roman jerseys just to let you know of, of who they actually were, right? And so Paul now touches in on this kind of sense of Philippian pride and says, hey, in, in the same way that you are a Roman colony, and by a Roman colony, what that means is you're supposed to live out the ethic of Rome. And as you live out the ethic of Rome, those who aren't Romans are supposed to look at you with, with a sense of jealousy of, of, I wish we were like that. Isn't the Roman Empire great? And, and they should long after what you have. As, you, as a Roman colony, you're supposed to live a life that causes other people to long after what you have. Uh, Paul says here in verse number 27, as citizens of heaven, now conduct yourself. Live in such a way uh, that, that you're by, abiding by the ethic of Jesus to such an extent that other people look at you and go, I want that what is it about them and, and so it begins to draw people in as proud of you as you are about your roman citizenship there is a citizenship you have that is higher than that and, and that is now you are citizens of heaven and so if paul were writing to us he would in no way downplay our american citizenship but he would say if you take any pride in that whatsoever any value in that whatsoever how much greater should your pride be that you are now considered a member of the kingdom of God? And now live in such a way, in the, in the, being this little outpost in the midst of all this darkness that is there, live in such a way that you begin to stand out, causing people to wonder, hey, what do they have? How can I be like that? Well, how do we do that? He says to live a life worthy. What, what does that even mean? It's not a concept here of, of we're trying to earn it or deserve it. So what it means to live a life worthy of the calling means that we live our lives in a continual grateful response to what God has done for us through his son Jesus on the cross. And, and recognizing how God sent his own son to earth to pay the penalty for our sin. And Jesus lived, died, and, and he rose again. Now we live in light and, and, and in the benefit of what God has done for us. That should cause us at every moment to have such a sense of gratitude that we now get to live out what he has given to us. So worthiness is not the idea of it. It's, it, it checks the box to earn it. It is, this is the rightful response to what he has done for us. Well, how do we do that? How do we live a life worthy? The text gives us a couple of examples that I just want to point out. First of all, the beginning of chapter 2, what, what Pastor Jason is going to talk about next week. He, he says within that that you and I are supposed to live a humble life. We'll get into the, this beautiful hymn in, in verses 5 through 11 that, that's now the story about Jesus. In the same way that Jesus lived a life of humility, you and I are to do the same thing. He says in, in verse 3 and 4, Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. It's the passage I use if a couple hasn't picked out a passage for a wedding. It's just my go-to passage for a wedding. That if you and I would, with our spouses, not, not just look to our own interests, but actually place the well-being of the other above ourselves, and you do that in a reciprocal kind of relationship, the marriage is going to flourish. There's a truth that we'll look at next week with Pastor Jason. That for a Christian, life flourishes in humility. We think it dies in humility, but life actually flourishes in humility. And so if you and I want to live a life worthy of the calling, whatever comes our way, what would it look like if 
we actually loved our neighbors. If we actually looked at somebody else, and no matter how they were treating us, we at minimum treated them with a base level of respect that any human being deserves with a sense of dignity because of who they are created in the image of God. That, that would cause us to stand out in, in this tribalized culture, in this survival of the fittest world, that would begin to cause us to stand out. So how, how do we live a life worthy? Well, we live with humility. Uh, another way we live a life worthy, notice, notice what the text says here, here in a unique way in verse number 28. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. You know, I, I grew up in the church. And so as a little boy in the late 80s, early 90s in the church, and then as a growing up teenager in the 90s within the church, I don't think anybody meant to teach this, but you know what I got a lot from pastors and Sunday school teachers and church members? It was fear. It was this terror of where we were and where we were going. And I mean, think about it. It was Y2K was going to be the rapture. Like, it was all coming to an end, friends. And, and you just got this communi constant communication of, man, you, you better, in a Bon Jovi kind of way, you better hold on to what we got doesn't make a difference if we make it or not. <laughs> We've got each other, and that's a lot for love. Um, I can't quote the Ten Commandments, but I got Bon Jovi. Okay. I'm guessing Jason can't quote Bon Jovi. This is what I bring. This is what I bring. But this idea of fear, it, it's, it's worse today than it was back then. This idea that anybody that opposes us is a threat, is a danger. And oh my goodness, we better watch out. We, 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 better, we better protect ourselves. We better stand up and fight back. And notice Paul doesn't say any of that. Instead he says, as you and I live a life worthy of the calling, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. He had no fear of Nero. No fear of the Roman guards. Why is that? Why does the Bible so insistent on us not having fear of others. It's because you and I cannot love people we fear. Fear is focused on self. It's why Jesus so often will say, fear not, get your eyes off yourself and look toward others. What would it look like instead of being afraid of your political opponent if you love them? What would it look like if instead of being afraid of the steps you hear behind you, you, you loved what was actually going on? What would, it, what would it look like if instead of being afraid of the direction of the country, of what comes next? I, I don't know about you, but pastorally, I, I feel like I have a little PTSD as we head into another election season. I want no part of it. But what if we weren't afraid? What if we saw this as just an opportunity to love? Whatever comes our way. The text here is very striking that Paul now calls us to live a life that is different, that would cause unbelievers to look at us. Humility would do that. Living a life free from fear of others would do that. But notice the last part of this text. Verse 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer with him. It's a part of the Christian life we don't like to talk about, especially in the Western evangelical church. We like the fun stuff, the forgiveness, the prosperity. But Paul here says, part of what it means to be a believer is as we live a life different from everybody else, there's going to be some negative consequences of that. And, and we're all guaranteed to experience some suffering as just fallen people that live in a fallen world. On Friday, I buried a 45-year-old woman. In the front row next to her grieving husband were their three very young sons, 10, 7, and 5. They're suffering. It's guaranteed. Sickness, disease, health, 
broken relationships, kids that rebel, hardships that come our way, that's, that's guaranteed. But there's also a guaranteed suffering that happens that if you and I try to live out the way of Jesus, it's going to rub against the idols of this culture. And that's going to cause some to question us, some to outright oppose us, to quote the words of Jesus at the end of the Beatitudes, for some to revile us and lie about us. And if you and I do not have the perspective of the pilot, when that turbulence comes, it's going to cause us, like the church at Philippi, to begin to question, God, do you even love us? Do you even see us? Is this gospel even true? And yet, if we will get the perspective of Jesus, we will recognize that any suffering we have here, as real as it is, ultimately is a temporary experience. And in comparison to the eternal realities, we can not only endure it, we can actually lean into it. And as we do, that will cause other people to look at us and go, there's something unique about them. Isn't it interesting that, that you can proclaim the gospel all day long, and if you're experiencing success after success after success, other people will hear that and be intrigued by that, but very rarely will be drawn to it. For if you're being successful while proclaiming the gospel, they will often write the story, I'm not good enough. That's their story, not mine. And yet when you and I live out our faith when it costs us something, when we live out our faith, when we love people even if they're not loving back, when we forgive even when we're not receiving forgiveness, when we're still proclaiming and preaching and living truth even when we're experiencing hatred, uh, whenever we proclaim the truth when it has a consequence to us, People are intrigued by that. Chances are the greatest testimony you will ever have whenever it comes to the things of Jesus are the moments in which you obey in the midst of suffering. Can I tell you something unfortunate about the character and nature of God? God has no hesitation allowing you and I to experience temporal, earthly suffering in order to accomplish eternal good in the lives of you and others. No hesitation. In the same way that when my kids were little, I had no hesitation holding my children down, allowing the doctor to give them a shot, knowing that, hey, this is for their good. God has no problem allowing earthly sorrow and suffering to come our way, knowing that he can use it for eternal purposes. But if you and I do not have the perspective of the pilot, it can feel way too overwhelming. But if you and I will obey in the midst of the sorrow, if we will act like citizens of heaven, even in this broken world, others will look at that and go, there's something to them. I don't know if Jason talked about this last week. I assume he did. I listened to his sermon last night, but I didn't get through it all. I, he was loud and I was tired. And... He was, it was really good. Yeah, I mean, it seriously was. The first 25 minutes were really good, but that's all I, that's all I gave him. But, um, but if, he, if he told this, then just, just know that, that I'm just repeating him. But anytime I read Philippians chapter 1, I hear an amen that's not in the text. You hear it? It, it comes from about the third row back, this really big, strong man. And next to him is his wife and, and a couple of kids. And, and as... as Epaphroditus comes back from visiting Paul in, in prison. Everybody gathers around and goes, how is he? As he shows up to church that next Sunday, how is he? How's Paul doing? Then Epaphroditus goes, oh, hey, hang out. Everybody sit down. I got a letter from him. And so he starts reading this letter. And, and you, you hear about your love abounding more and more in knowledge and, and depth of insight. And, and he gets to verse number 12 and, and he reads off. Now, 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 what has happened to me, brothers and sisters, is actually meant to advance the gospel. And that's the, that's the first time you hear it. It's a, it's a loud, bellowing amen from the third row. And, and as Paul begins to explain his situation and everything that's taken place, you hear this, uh-huh, uh-huh, coming from the third row. And, and he gets to this idea for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And from the third row, you hear, that's right. 
And then you get to verse number 27, and the text says, Now whatever happens to you, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the Lord. And on the third row, a man begins to stand up and to clap, because he knows it's so true. Who is that man? That man is the man who in Acts chapter 16 was a Roman soldier. Paul and Silas in Philippi had been arrested, thrown in prison. When at midnight an earthquake hit, miraculously freeing them from their shackles. Now in that moment, I say, thank you, Jesus, and I'm out. But Paul in that moment, recognizing that this Roman guard will die if he runs, though unshackled, stays put. And in the moment, saves the man's earthly life, causing the man to look at Paul and to say, why? What is it? What would cause you to do that? Why would you... Put my interest above your own interest, Philippians chapter 2. As Paul then at that moment had the opportunity to share the gospel, what God had done for him, how at one time he had murdered other people as well. At one time he had been just as evil as this soldier, but now his life had been transformed and that is now available to you. And that man was so convicted by the testimony of Paul in the midst of suffering that he came to know Christ. And Acts chapter 16 says not only him, but his wife and his whole family. And he is one of the first members of the church at Philippi. And as Paul begins to say, what has happened to me is actually meant to advance the gospel. My imprisonment, my beatings, my enslavement has actually been for my good. The eternal consequences of what is happening to me is far worse than these earthly sufferings in this moment. That man can't contain himself because his eternal destiny has changed because of the obedience of Paul. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it, it would make no sense to this world. It makes no sense to this world to try to win to Jesus the very captor that's holding you tight. It makes no sense to this world. It makes all the sense in the world if you and I have been recipients of God's grace. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, you brought us into this place on the first day of the week and we have no idea what tomorrow holds the places that you're going to send us into this next week are unimaginable and yet you have given us the answer today long before we ask the question what are we to do you've already told us we're to live our lives in response to who you are and what you've done for us empower us to do just that it's in jesus name that we pray amen